So we're in 1 Peter, chapter 2, on page 1344 in the Church Bible. I believe it's going to be up to the screen as well. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once <coughs> you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the <coughs> sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that they that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Submit, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as a supreme authority, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence it the talk of the foolish people. Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as, as God's slaves. Show proper to, respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honour the Emperor. Slaves in reverent fear of God, and if slaves in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if somebody bears <coughs> up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this, commendable <coughs> this is commendable before God. <coughs> to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to, to who judges thus justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Barry, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to see you. Great to welcome you to Calabax Church uh, as well. Um, lots of faces that I know, a few faces I don't know. So uh, do you can say hi afterwards. Uh, I'm Nathan. Uh, it's great to see you all. But I wonder if afterwards, or maybe at some point this morning, I was to ask you, uh, who are you? I wonder how you might respond. Okay? Uh, I wonder how you might define yourself. Uh, it might be something to do with the location. It might be, hi, I'm, I'm Nathan. Uh, I'm new here. Or whatever your name is, it's probably not Nathan. Very unlikely. If, hi, I'm Nathan, I'm new here. Oh, hi, I'm Nathan, I've been here all my life, or I'm just visiting, something like that. It might be uh, to do with your family. Hi, I'm Nathan, I'm married, I've got two kids, whatever your situation is. It might be to do with your possessions. Uh, hello, I'm Nathan, my Ferrari's in the garage. This is my everyday car, <laughs> something like that. 
Uh, or career, hello, I'm Nathan, I'm on staff here at church. Or it might be something to do with your, your gender or your race or your sexuality. It might be something like, hi, I'm Nathan, I'm a straight white British male, something like that. It might be more negatively as well. Perhaps you wouldn't say this out loud to someone you're just meeting, but you might think this. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm not worth getting to know. I might think something like that. Or you might think upon your struggles or your battles. Hi, I'm Nathan. I'm, I'm fighting addiction. It might be something along those lines. You might not say them out loud, but you might think them. Well, in this letter we're looking at here, 1 Peter, we're spending a few weeks sort of going through it, a passage at a time. Peter, who's the author, has been uh, writing to a group of Christians he calls sojourners or foreigners and exiles in this world. Uh, temporary people who are just passing through on their way to an eternal heavenly home. Uh, you might say they're currently nomads, living in tents, uh, passing through until one day they're brought home. Uh, with that mindset, it might be understandable, even expected maybe, that they might struggle with their identity, who they are. How do they fit in whilst being surrounded by those who perhaps look or, or sound no different, but have a very different identity, a set of values, a different purpose, or just are in a different culture altogether. But Peter wants them to know they've got a clear identity as Christians, which not only defines them individualistically, how we might introduce ourselves to someone else, but also gives them a wonderful identity corporately as a gathered people in the land that they're sojourning in. Uh, for those of you who are Christians here this morning, that's your identity as well. We're going to explore that in a moment, so do listen along. But if you're here just looking into Christian things, maybe for the first time, we're delighted you're here. It's great that you are looking at these things, but perhaps you recognise some of those struggles with identity, with who you are, and you're kind of exploring those things. So do keep listening in, because uh, the Christian identity, who is found in Christ, is very, very attractive. So it might prick your interests a little bit more. It'd be great if you had your Bibles open in front of you. We're going to be referring back to that passage we read. It's page 1344. If you've uh, shut them or put them to one side, it'd be great to grab them back uh, as we look into the text this morning. We're going to see uh, two truths from the text. This one I've put them on the screen for us there. Firstly, that sojourners have a, a clear identity, but also that sojourners have a clear purpose. We're going to be exploring those two truths now. So the first one then, sojourners have a clear identity. Well, if you have been with us the last few weeks, you'll notice the obvious switch in Peter's metaphor that he's using. He has been writing, saying, uh, encouraging us to stick with the word, that stick with the Bible, stick with the truths of it, drink it like milk, like infants, to get strong in the enduring nature of it. But now, as we come to verse 4, we find that although we, we come individually to drink and, and, and feed on the Word, we find that that corporately does something to who we are in Jesus. So just look down at verse 4 and 5. Me, it's top of column 1 there in the church Bible, just under that heading. Uh, verse 4 says this, As you come to him, the living stone, Rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It might be a rather unusual metaphor to our ears, in fact. Uh, it's one that is steeped in, in Bible history, Old Testament and knew the idea of living stones. 
stones. Peter is saying that we are living stones made like the living stone who is Jesus. And the, the clues that Jesus is that original living stone are there in the passage. In, in verse 4 you might notice that Peter describes as one rejected by humans but chosen and precious to God. That matches the description of Jesus that we find in the New Testament. But Peter also uses three Old Testament verses there to help back up this, what he's saying, this metaphor. Uh, in verse 6, verse 7 and verse 8. And Jesus himself used the one in verse 7 from Psalm 118. He used that about himself in the Gospels. Also, Peter used it in Acts as well to refer to Jesus. Uh, but Peter then sort of expands his Old Testament knowledge and thinks, right, well, if that one refers to Jesus, then these two in Isaiah, which are verse 6 and verse 8, also must refer to Jesus. So as Jesus has applied it, so has Peter done the same. And this living stone, which he refers to, Jesus, chosen and precious to God, is who we, as Christians, collectively are like. We're, we're not dead or useless ancient stone. No, we're living stone. Living stone is a kind of an unusual phrase, isn't it? We have that new identity. We're living stone. And as Peter says, as stone, we're being built together corporately. So firstly, we're being built into a spiritual house. You note the footnote in the Bible there, if you've spotted it, that it says, or into a temple of the Spirit, a spiritual house, a temple. All living stones who are like Christ are being gathered together, are being built together into a place where God dwells. And that temple building is now you, the church, that's where God dwells in you. But more than just being building or walls, Peter extends the metaphor. So you're not dead stones, mere bricks and mortar. You're living stones. And as living stones, you'll just be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices to God. You're not just to sit in this place, God dwells, looking merely decorative. You've got a job to do. There's a role here. You are to be useful. You are to be useful in the service of God, the King. Offering yourself in holy living, in worship, in sacrifice, to the purpose of God. Uh, but notice this, the only way you can do this well, Peter says, the only way that you can be acceptable to God is through Jesus. You know, you can do all you want in the name of God. You can do all you want in performance. But it is not acceptable to God. It is not worthy of God, not good enough for God, unless all of you, all of who you are and what you do is in Jesus. The first living stone, who makes it so that all of us can be acceptable as well as living stones. Worthy, good enough for God, only in Jesus. Uh, Peter continues his argument. He refers back to the Old Testament. You'll notice he, he uses the counter argument. You are not these things as well. So verse 8, for example. You're not those who stumble and fall because they've disobeyed the message. We're people of the message. We've been the ones drinking milk to go back to the previous metaphor. But then we get to verse 9. So he says, this is who you're not. But verse 9... This is who you are. But you are, verse 9, look down with me there, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Uh, this list, this, this wonderful little summary list of, of who we are as gathered people, Corporately, this is our identity. It is not a new thing that Peter's just introduced. This is built on all that he said before. It's like a summary of all of his ideas so far. 
Uh, so the first thing he says is that we're chosen people. Uh, just as the living stone was chosen and precious and set apart, so are we. We are selected uh, not by birthright, not by our race, not by the fact we're who we are, but actually it's because of God's mercy and new birth that we're selected. And we've been talking about that already in chapter 1. Thanks, Claire. Uh, praise be to the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, in his great mercy. No, it's not for anything. He has given us new birth into a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus. We're a chosen people in his mercy. Then he says we're a royal priesthood. We're set apart in the king's household. We are royal to serve God, to serve him alone. And because we're part of his household and royal, God shields us and protects us. So uh, 1 verse 5 says this, Who through faith, let's talk about us, Christians, are shielded by God's power to the coming salvation. We're royal, we're protected, we're in the household to serve as priests. And then we're a holy nation, a new nation, a new group of gathered people called together to be like no others. We're called to be holy, pure, set apart, sanctified, displaying the attributes of our king. Our leader. So 1 verse 15. But just as he who called you, that's God, is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it's written, be holy, because I am holy. We're to be a holy nation. We're to be God's special possession. That's the fourth thing he says. We're not any old folk roaming free. We're an owned people. We're wanted, we're loved, we're considered worthy, saved and redeemed, bought with a price. So 1 verse 18, For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life, but with the precious blood of Christ. Uh, Peter is going to go on and call us a, a freed people who should consider themselves God's slaves in verse 16 of chapter 2, which we read before. And I don't think he's meaning slavery in a derogatory sense that maybe the world thinks of slavery there. He is going to remind us of that as he talks about slaves and masters. But Peter sees God's slaves being God's slaves as something wonderful. Being owned by God. Being his alone, set apart for him. A chosen, a precious people, bought by God who paid a high but worthwhile price for us in the death of Jesus. But as God's slaves, that's who we are, we're no longer subject to anything on earth. Just as priests in the temple serve God alone. So do we. We as living stones also only serve God alone. Called, chosen and precious. Set apart, owned by the king who has brought us into his household. Who shields us, purifies us, making us good and who considered us worthy enough to be bought at high price. Now that's a lot of information, isn't it, to take in and go. But how wonderful is that? Just think about that for a moment. Just reflect on those things. That's who we are as Christians. What an identity. What a, what a rich and full and worthwhile identity. This is who you are. No wonder we gather together and sing. No wonder we gather together and extol the praise of God, declare his praises, declare his excellencies, declare his wonderfulness. No wonder we get together and do that from someone who has brought us out of darkness into his wonderful light. No wonder we get together and do that. I mean, there might be something in your back of your mind and you might think, well, what have I done to deserve this? That's far too wonderful. 
I'm unworthy of it. Unworthy to be a part of something this great. Well, here's the thing. You've done nothing at all to get this. The identity we have is not something we should boast in. It's not individually saying, wow, how great am I? But that we might together give glory and praise to God. Now just look down at verse 9 again. And verse 10, it's the bottom of column 1 there. But you are a chosen people, a royal priest, that a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him. Who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once, you lot, you were not a people, verse 10. But now you are the people of God. Once, you would not receive mercy. But now you have received mercy. You are who you are because of God's mercy. It is a generous and a wonderful gift. From God's grace. Your identity as people of God, the church, is bound up in the one who saved you. In Christ. It is a great and wonderful gift given to you out of God's mercy. It's a great calling, an inspiration in how we live life. I like the way a guy called Michael Allen, you don't need to remember his name, he's an American theologian, uh, he puts it this way, and I like the way he uses the word holiness, sort of for who we are and how we live now, our new identity and purpose in Christ. I like the way he writes this. Therefore, holiness, that way we now live, is not only a task, but it's also a gift. It's not a calling, not only a calling, but also a reality evoked by God's declaration. God says this. It's not only the vocation of the Christian, but it's also integral to the inheritance enjoyed in Christ. We were thinking about that the other week. Holiness is an expectation from us, as well as a startling result of God's election, his choosing of us. It's truly incredible and, and Alan Riley helps us uh, in our thinking because he pushes us on and he's saying well because of who we are, because of our changed identity, we're now in Christ the holy people, the gathered holy people. Our purpose, our mission, our lifestyle should change as a result of who you are. It's a gift to be used also as a task. So let's look at that now. This is a little bit shorter, but sojourners have a clear purpose. There's a road ahead. Uh, I read about a, a one-off radio show produced for Radio 4 uh, this week, intriguingly entitled God Squad. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard about this. I haven't listened to the show yet, so if somebody's listened to it and said, why on earth are you talking about that? I'm sorry. I just read about it. I haven't listened to it. Uh, but the premise of the show in the article it said, it was about a Christian union in a university freshers week, uh, which is probably why it's, it's on now. Uh, and what the Christian union are trying to do in the show is make the Christian message stand out amongst every other society and thing in university uh, life. Uh, and the authors of the show, who aren't Christians, said this about it. It said, it's really just a vehicle for us to talk about young people having faith in a faithless world. Young people having faith in a faithless world. You can maybe see why it pricks my interest. Many of us here will have experienced that kind of thing. Uh, some of you might be experiencing the university lifestyle for the very first time. And trying to keep your head above the water against this barrage of everything that university brings with it, this world and student life brings and throws at you. But whether or not it's at school, or college, or, or university, or whether it's just your first job and you're in work, or just at home, as Christians, we feel the pressure of living with our Christian identity, our faith, 
in a faithless world. So how do we do it? How do we do it? Well, Peter says we need to know who we are. Understanding our identity, we need to prepare ourselves, prepare our souls for war, and be prepared to do good, even if we're accused of being evil. Now that's a hard task. Just have a look down at verse 11 with me. It's the top of column 2. If you've got your church Bibles there open in front of you, page 1344, verse 11 and 12 say this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And as you read that, and as you kind of skip on and read on, as we have done already, and we will do in a moment, notice how everything we do, our purpose, is wrapped up in our identity. How although individually we face tough and challenging situations, we are a part of the gathered, collected people together called to be holy. So we're a holy nation, Peter's just said. We're made pure. So we wage war on unholiness, impurity and sin in our soul. We're royal. We're, we're set, sent from the king's household, prepared to live amongst those who don't recognize God as king. We're priests doing good, living such good lives individually, spurring on the collective, that even though we may be accused of doing wrong, folk will see our good deeds and be pointed to God as we're his special possession. And notice how it's in every situation as well. It's not when we pick and choose. It's not this and then and sometimes. It's every situation under every authority. Uh, verse 13 there carries on. But submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Why do we submit ourselves? It's for the Lord's sake. Peter reminds us in verse 16 we are free people. And there's no doubt about that. We serve God alone. But as we are God's slaves, bought by him, he sends us as his slaves into the world. Sent into our situations to be subject and submit under his command to every earthly authority. Who are also, verse 14, sent by him. God. And I think when God says every authority, funnily enough, he means every authority. Whether it be high ups like government or prime ministers, the judicial system, the police, down to everyday authorities, parents, teachers, lecturers, line managers, higher ups in the office. Every authority, you fill in your blank for your week. Being a Christian is a wonderful gift, but it's humbling. It's humbling. And it attracts suffering. There will be ignorant folk, verse 15, who talk foolishly about us and our faith, our identity. There will be harsh bosses, verse 18, who we need to submit to out of reverent fear for God. We are called to live like this, just as Jesus did. For the sake of others. Let me say that again. We're called to live like this, just as Jesus did, for the sake of others. But verse 11, those who accuse you falsely might come and glorify God when he comes. We suffer like Jesus, who endured harsh insults, foolish words from ignorant folk. Who endured rejection and suffered at the hands of people. Even though, as Peter reminds us, Jesus was completely innocent, perfect, pure, called, 
chosen, precious to God. Verse 22 there, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So we should follow his example. Let's look at his example. Verse 23, there, bottom of column 2. When they hurled their insults at him, that's Jesus, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, this is what he did, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. Jesus entrusted his suffering to the Father who took his suffering and used it for something wonderful. The salvation of your souls. He bore our sins to make us a holy nation. Right in God's eyes, pure in God's eyes. By his wounds we've been made God's special possession. Just as Jesus lived his life for you, we're called to live holy lives for the sake of others. Jesus entrusted his suffering to the Father, who took his suffering and used it for good to gather you as his own special possession. A holy nation to himself. Or use a slightly different language, verse 25, a slightly different metaphor. For you were like sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. We should follow his example. And in the midst of suffering, as we pass through this life, we entrust ourselves to the Father, who despite our suffering calls us to good deeds. And it's those good deeds which God will use to bring unbelievers to glorify him on the day he visits, just as when he visited you, he healed you and made you acceptable through Christ. I mentioned that Radio 4 show earlier, didn't I? And I said the author of it wasn't a Christian. In fact, the author of it was a hardline atheist, self-confessed in the Dawkins mode. But he is now more sympathetic and open to faith. And the article I, in the article I read, he made some really interesting uh, comment on how that journey is taking place. From hardline to more sympathetic. And this is, this is what he says. I've put, put it on the screen for you uh, there. Uh, <laughs> or maybe I've not. There it is. Thanks for that. So Chisnel lads. Chisnel's the author. Okay? Chisnel lads. I have an evangelical grandmother who does a good job of making the questions of Christianity unignorable. I like that phrase. And here's, here's what, how she does that. Both because, two reasons, one, she makes a good case for the kind of life that Jesus wants us to live in her tireless charity and community work. That's her good deeds. But also because she doesn't stop banging on about God. I love that. Such a normal way of putting it. I think Peter would probably say that she declares the praises, the excellencies, the wonderfulness of her Saviour. But she doesn't stop banging on about God. And it's her good deeds. I wonder how many hours that granny has prayed for him. Given her life in good deeds and been declaring the praises of her Saviour. Uh, the reality is he's not a Christian yet, but in that suffering, I hope she, the granny, just continues to entrust herself to God. As she follows in her Saviour's way, continuing in good deeds, declaring his praises. And so, as we wrap up to grannies and the rest of us, who are sojourners here in Parvab, let's be clear on our gathered identity in Christ. And how we allow that to define us and impact us individually as we understand what it means for all of us as a church 
to be a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a chosen people, God's special possession. How that identity spurs us on to do good deeds, to do good, and to declare his praises and glorify him. That's our purpose, our sojourners. Let me just pray for us as we go and do that. Father, we really need your help in this. Lord, we are so thankful and we are so amazed at that wonderful gift of mercy we have received and that you call us your own. How amazing and wonderful that is. And as we reflect on that, Father, help us to live our lives now. Help us to live in a way that honours you, that shows you off in a way that is holy, as royal priests here in a faithless world. We ask for your help in that. Help us to declare your praises as we do good in our world. In your name we pray. Amen.